Welcome to Copcast. I'm Rumbi Chakamba, Associate Editor at DevEx, and I've headed to Sham el Sheikh in Egypt for this year's United Nations Climate Conference. In this podcast series, we bring you inside the walls of the Blue Zone for a series of in depth conversations with climate and development leaders, asking them the big questions. What's really needed to make meaningful progress towards climate goals, and what role should the development community play to support that? We never expected that we would see negative progress during the period of the SDGs. And what we're seeing now, and what we were seeing even before COVID struck, was hunger rising for the first time in decades. This year, world leaders gathered at COP27 as communities around the world grapple with the food crisis driven by the war in Ukraine and the impact of climate change. An estimated 828 million people are chronically food insecure, and 345 million people are at crisis levels or worse and in need of food assistance. At COP27, CGIAR co hosted the first Food and Agriculture Pavilion aimed at putting the transformation of agri food systems at the heart of the COP agenda. I sat down with Claudia Sadov, Executive Director of the Coalition, to discuss climate smart solutions to the food crisis. Claudia, thank you so much for joining me. So, this is kind of an exciting year. It's the first year that there's a food systems pavilion here at COP27 and you're co-hosting that. Why is it so important to have food systems and not just agriculture included in the agenda? What we, what we know at this point is that you can't separate food systems from climate change. We know that if we stopped all fossil fuel use today, we still couldn't meet the Paris goals for climate change without transforming our food systems. Our food systems are still responsible for more than a third of global greenhouse emissions. But what's really exciting is that they also offer some tremendous solutions, both on adaptation and mitigation for climate change. So the idea that this year, for the first time at any COP, we have this food systems pavilion and this focus on food systems, it's really exciting for us because we see it just so much in the solution space for climate. And you've been working in the solutions, innovation space for such a long time. What do you want um, global leaders to know and how can they make sure that these solutions are actually going to people who are on the front lines? I think it's, it's really important for leaders to recognize that food systems um, are, are really part of the solution. And the, the, the opportunity to uh, to create the food systems that we want, that are more sustainable, that are more nature positive, but that also um, allow us to better serve the hungry, the poor, um, and the malnutrition, and the obesity, frankly, that we face in the world. We've got such a, such a jumble of food challenges. As we, as we develop the SDGs, we all expected that while we might not have fully achieved them, they were ambitious. We never expected that we would see negative progress during the period of the SDGs. And what we're seeing now, and what we were seeing even before COVID struck, was hunger rising for the first time in decades. So hunger itself and food systems themselves are very much in need of transformation. And that transformation, if we do it properly, can really further our climate goals. By 2050, agriculture and food systems broadly could become net carbon sinks rather than emitters. If we choose a mindful path to transforming the way we manage our food, our land, and our water, we can do a tremendous amount of good in the, in the climate space as well. So what I'm hoping is that as we come through and, and out of this COP, this recognition of food systems being at the heart of the climate challenge, solution space is there, and that when we think about adaptation, a really constructive space to focus our adaptation efforts is on this mindful transformation of our food, land, and water systems. So what exactly would you want to see in the outcomes at the end of these two weeks? Well, I would love to see arguably three things. One is uh, the conversation that's ongoing around the adaptation agenda, I think is so very important. Um, I, I believe that the conversations around mitigation um, obviously need to continue apace and there's broad recognition of the direction we need to go in, in mitigation with regard to fuels. 
I think we can do much more with regard to food systems in lowering our carbon emissions in food systems if we focus on doing it. But we haven't really begun to uh, flesh out the adaptation agenda the way I think we need to. And that's a big goal here at the COP, and the COP presidency is putting forward an adaptation agenda. So to see that really articulated is one of the main goals. Another is to recognize that by adaptation we do mean activities like transforming our food systems. And to do that smartly and rightly and with the aspirations that we all have for a sustainable, healthful, equitable food system, we, we need continued research and innovation. We need to do things differently than we are doing them now. And to do that properly without risking hunger, because you don't play <laughs> with food systems, food systems keep us all fed and secure, um, we need real evidence and, and research and innovation. So I'm hoping that there will be support and more finance for research and innovation to transform food systems. And I think the third really is the overarching goal of this COP, which is implementation, right? It's really to start moving out there and getting the work done. And this is something, uh, a space in which I hope that CGIR can play a real role as well. We're active in upwards of 70 countries. We've got 9,000 people out there working on the ground to transform food, land, and water systems. Uh, working very closely with national agricultural research uh, systems, and extension systems, with small and medium enterprises, with farmers organizations, with national governments. And we really hope that we can, uh, can contribute to truly implementing the sort of um, both adaptation and mitigation solutions that are being talked about here this week. The world is facing an unprecedented global food crisis. Here at DevEx, we're following the state of food insecurity around the world and the solutions that are needed to overcome it. I'm Teresa Welsh, senior reporter, and I'm also the author of DevEx Dish, a free weekly newsletter bringing you a comprehensive look at everything that matters in the world of food. Each Wednesday, DevEx Dish will be your guide through the interlocking policy, infrastructure, climate, agriculture, nutrition, and human rights issues remaking the way food is grown and distributed. Visit devex.com slash newsletters to subscribe and get your weekly update on the race for a sustainable global food system. And then speaking of um, innovations and implementing, how do we make sure that these are actually available to like smallholder farmers, like those who are actually like on the front lines and they're feeling this pang of like climate change? Now that's, that's such the central question, right? Because these farmers are both so vulnerable and uh, the communities that they feed are so vulnerable. And at the same time, they are some of the most resourceful, resilient people on the planet. What they need, what they deserve, is the tools and the innovations that we can provide them to help make their job easier on the front line. So how do we, uh, CGIR, our focus is primarily on smallholder farmers and agriculture. So this is what we do, and we see ourselves really engaging in three ways to make sure that we, that our solutions and innovations reach the farmers who need them. And that means conversations when we prioritize what we focus on. Science is endlessly interesting, but we need urgent as much as interesting. So we have partners that we talk to about our prioritization, national governments, farm organizations, to prioritize what we're doing, to make sure we're delivering the right research and technology that's needed so that it'll be taken up, as opposed to finding, finding it interesting, right? <laughs> Secondly, we focus on partners who help us to create those solutions because they need to be solutions that will work in context. So we work with universities, national agricultural research organizations, again, farmers organizations locally to co-create the solutions and innovations that will be easy to uptake and in demand uh, from those who need them. And then finally, when we look really at scaling, another set of partnerships potentially, sometimes it's the same, but it could be the national extension services who might outscale the new seeds, for example, that are developed, or small and medium enterprises and private sectors in the countries that we work with. If there's a, if there's a commercially viable way to outscale uh, technologies, etc., those are groups we want to work with as well because we need to keep focused on those outcomes from the very beginning, from the moment we decide what we're going to focus on it. 
shifting our focus. Uh, I, I have a, a friend, Yemi, who we always say, we need to shift our focus from filling the library shelves to filling the market shelves in the pantries and homes. And that's what we have to do from the very beginning of, uh, of the work that we do. It's so interesting that you mentioned solutions that are actually needed. How do you, because like, how do you bridge that gap? Because there's also like this indigenous knowledge. You mentioned that the farmers are already so resilient. So how do you bridge that gap and bring in the indigenous knowledge as well as the science to actually make sure that communities are able to uptake this? Right. You know, it's so interesting. I feel like um, we've come late to recognize, we as a global community have come late to recognize the power of, the indi of indigenous knowledge. And the irony now is that so much of the indigenous knowledge is now being challenged by these changing and unpredictable weather patterns and by the frequency and severity of climate shocks that we're feeling. So it's now um, somewhat of a, of a different challenge of both gathering the indigenous knowledge and trying to supplement that so work together with the science that we have that's predictive and forecasting with the traditional knowledge that we have to, to, to find solutions that are fit for today because things are just so much so different than they were and have been in a relatively steady state for so long until these last few decades. So here again it becomes a question of working much more closely with local researchers um, uh, in the CG system anyway, we have, uh, we have local, a uh, global footprint that's quite extraordinary, but still working with a breadth of, of researchers in the spaces that we work in um, and reaching out to, to those communities. Really, both again, both for prioritizing and for co-creating the solutions, um, because the knowledge is pertinent both in terms of what will, uh, what will disrupt agriculture, what's really needed, and what will be welcome in that traditional society as a new solution or innovation. So it's really in all of those spaces. Okay, thank you so much for joining me and taking the time out. I'm so excited to see the Food Systems Pavilion and I'll make sure I take some time to go out there and see it. And we'll definitely be following your work here at DevEx. Well, thank you so much and thank you for all you're doing to put the word out. Thanks for listening to Copcast. We'll be publishing episodes every day throughout COP27. So make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast streaming platform. And if you've enjoyed today's episode, please share it with others you think would be interested in it. You can also leave us a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. If you have some feedback about this episode that you want to share or are at COP and want to let us know what we should be covering, we'd love to hear from you. You can find us on social media at devix and at rumbichakamba underscore, or you can drop us an email at podcast at devix.com.